Travis, to give you a rundown, and everyone here, I don't know if any of you have been here before to our It's Friday Artist Lecture Series. Um, this is the final one for the semester. Um, we typically have had artists, we've had th three artists who've talked about their practice and kind of went through, you know, kind of each of them have uh, talked about the history and the trajectory of their work. This is going to be a little bit different. This particular um, uh, lecture is with the photo professor here at ECC, uh, Travis Limbill, and he is going to, um, I think, uh, talk a little bit about his own art practice, a little bit about the school's uh, photo program, and um, I do have some questions for you that I just made up to just pop quiz you. Travis, uh, and if you guys have questions ab uh, about anything with Travis's artwork or anything related to the program um, at school, um, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, Professor Brandolino is there checking the chat and she's gonna formulate the questions um, and likely interject with anything that is pertinent to the conversation, <laughs> which is welcomed. Um, and just make sure um, you, it, you make sure, do, Amy, do you need them to, to, to post a question for credit for the class? Is that part they of your- in, they, they can, right? They, it, it's, it's, yeah, yes, post, post question. If you're here, you guys um, throw a question on there at some point. All right, so uh, introduction wise, uh, I typically start with some really, you know, personal story about my relationship with the artist. And I'm gonna do that again. I wanna talk about Travis for just a couple minutes because um, I worked with Travis in the photo department for about four years here um, as an adjunct uh, instructor uh, with him. And I learned a ton from him about how to teach and how to listen. And I think that's going to be very evident here um, with what he talks about, I hope. I don't know what he's gonna talk about, um, but we'll see. Uh, and there's one thing that I will ask at some point, I want Travis, this is my request, to explain what Ohana is to everyone here and not the Lilo and Stitch version of it, <laughs> but, uh, or maybe it is. So I'm gonna go ahead and do you need the screen, Travis? I can, it's ready to share, whatever you need. Yeah, maybe later I can, you know, if there are questions about my work and stuff, I can pull up my, my website, but yeah. So go ahead, whatever you want. Do you want me to ask you questions? Or what do you want? Um, so the, the crowd I have here right now, this is the, this is the group of, of people that left this requirement opportunity to the end. Yep. That's, these are my people. This is like, this is a good fit for me. <laughs> Not that I want to advocate for procrastination, but I gotta tell you, I understand. So um, yeah, that's uh, Juan and I have been working together for about uh, four years uh, now in different capacities, but I've been here at ECC since 2009. So uh, I know the, I'll try not to bore you too much with the, the history, but I will tell you since he mentioned Ohana and that'll come back around in a little bit. Um, you know, I was just a, a freshman year art student. I took photo, a little bit of photo in high school, um, but it wasn't really an arts class. I was in a small town in Kentucky. We didn't have like an arts program at the high school there. Um, it was more like, a, you know, graphic arts, you know, I guess so, so more commercial and not, um, you know, fine art directed. So that's where I first started working with photography. And then I got into college. I didn't know what I was going to do. Like most students, you know, I was just sitting in a photo one class, I hopped around majors, I started out in architecture, and it wasn't for me. And, you know, like so many students, you're just trying to figure out what a good fit is for you. And so you you just sample stuff. And that's what I was doing. Um, you know, kind of on the art track, but not sure where I was really going to fit. 
making my parents very, very nervous because, you know, we, we were not a family of, of means and, you know, they're trying to make sure my sister and I get a college education, but at the same time, they're like, yeah, are you sure you want to study art? You know, like when you look at tuition and things like that. So there's all these kind of competing pressures, social pressures, you know, family pressures, you know, uncertainty within yourself about what you're going to pursue. But that was that was my beginning. And then I just took more and more, got a photo degree uh, at Miami in Ohio, uh, went on to get a graduate degree at Clemson in South Carolina, and then kind of hopped around teaching at different places before I, I made it up here uh, in 2009. And I've been here since. So prior to coming here, I taught um, I probably studied and taught about equal amounts drawing and photography, but all my degrees are in um, photography, um, and that's primarily what I do here at, at ECC. And probably, you know, if you've ever been a student in my class, you'll hear me talk quite a bit about the importance of, of drawing, even if you're going to pursue some other field, um, just as a valuable skill. I have a question for you, Travis, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and I'm very curious about this. Um, what was your earliest memory of photography? Now, it doesn't have to be art related, but like yeah. where did photography come into your life where you actually thought, oh, this is something different? Um, you know, it, it kind of started out as a, um, a profound dislike of photography. Uh, I was always jealous in, in college because people had these great, origin stories. And I don't know if they were just bullshit or like if they legitimately happened, but you felt like you had to have some art origin story, you know, like a Marvel comic where, you know, someone, some mysterious stranger handed you a paintbrush or you were wandering along a beach and the camera washed up or like, you know, something strange. And I didn't have anything like that. It was just more like, ah, I gradually got into it. But growing up, you know, my experience of photography was, um, one of my parents, but usually my mom, was in charge of getting the family photos. So photography was the thing that interfered with every single fun thing I wanted to do as a kid or a teenager. You always had to get the stupid photo first. You had to get the photo before you blew out the candles on the cake. You had to get the photo before you opened up the Christmas presents, before you ran out onto the beach in a vacation. You had to, everybody had to stand up and fake it. It didn't matter if you'd been at each other's throats like 30 seconds before, you had to like play nice and get your photo. Photography to me was a nuisance, was an inconvenience. And then when I got later in high school, I realized that my grandfather, my dad's dad, had a, uh, you know, Pentax K1000, which is the, or he had a Canon actually, but it's the type of camera that we check out to our Darkroom One students. And I saw that there were actually things that you could manipulate and control. It wasn't just a point and click. And at the age I was, and the fact that there was no way in hell I was going to get my own car, my parents, you know, didn't have the ability to do that. I certainly didn't have mon enough money to even get a terrible car. And so the camera became my machine. You know, that was something that I could manipulate, control and learn and work on and fine tune. And uh, I was still into to drawing as I had been since I was a young, young kid. Uh, but I like the idea of, of working with that machine as, as well. And so that's where it really started in, in high school and why I took that, that graphic arts course. I was a bit bummed as, as I think I had a lot of friends who were too, where you had to choose. You either were going on the college prep track or they're like, no, you're an auto shop kid or no, you're an art kid. You know, and they forced you into these weird polarized choices about your identity and, and your professional track. And um, that really bugged me. I understand, you know, ac educational systems are always trying to figure out ways to, re to resolve these things, but um, they really did force you to choose, like you're going to college or you're going to focus on this stuff that no one's really going to take seriously or, you know, um, that sort of thing. But I managed somehow to, to filter those in throughout the, the course of my education. Amy, how's the chat looking? Anything uh, coming up through there? We can't hear you. It's my specialty. Um, there's a couple, and I'll kind of filter some in. Um, there's actually a bunch right now. Um, 
how can photography be used to encapsulate other kinds of art that you've made, like drawings? And how can you make a photo more interesting and not just be taking a picture of something? Yeah, yeah, I get that a lot in my, my just photo classes that I teach. Or so for the first part, you know, photography becomes, you know, in a, in a really utilitarian way, the, the best means of kind of sharing something like a, an analog drawing, if I'm not doing a digital drawing, which so many great tools for that now too. I've just been playing with sketchbook and procreate and that sort of stuff. Um, and in times like these, I don't know how much our drawing classes are incorporating those digital tools, but they're awesome. But traditionally I've done analog drawings working in my sketchbook, things like that. And so taking a photograph of those is a way to disseminate it through social media or my website, um, which is purely photo focused right now. I, I don't really put drawings up there as much as I used to, but uh, that becomes a way to share those with a wider audience, um, you know, but then if I were to pursue this, there's all sorts of great ways, um, you know, to take your drawings, combine them with photography and create like animations. Um, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think of the artist, the main artist who uh, I usually show in art appreciation when I teach it, who does animations based on drawings that are then photographically recorded. Um, I'll have to come up with it later, but uh, but la just last week in I think I think it was photo history. One of the discussion posts was here's a group of artists who aren't necessarily photographers, but they use photography. So we have like a nature based artist like Andy Goldsworthy, you know, and he's working with things that just disintegrate, disappear, change over time, ice that melts, leaves that blow away. And so the photograph becomes a way to preserve that and share that experience with a larger group. So, you know, lots of different ways that you can, uh, you can use photo not to, to really make a pun or underscore this, but as the medium, as the in-between, the art you make, getting that art to a, a larger public, it doesn't have to be a photograph, but the photograph is the vehicle by which you share that information with others. As to what to photograph, um, I think the best advice that I give to beginning students, because it's always the, what do I photograph? You know, particularly if you feel like you're stuck somewhere where there's not a lot of interesting stuff. Um, I find that to be a big benefit. If I was teaching photography, you know, near the North Rim of the Grand Canyon, I, I feel in some ways students are at a disadvantage because they have all this incredible subject matter available at their fingertips. You know, anybody can kind of point a camera at a phenomenal subject or a profoundly interesting person and get an image that that's kind of interesting because the subject matter already is is interesting. But when someone gives you a bed sheet and says, make an interesting photograph of this bed sheet, well, then you, you're really pushing yourself as a creative person to try and come up with something that's unique from the other you know, 11 people in your class. I had a, a story uh, from when I was in graduate school and I'd spent some time studying in Italy and there was this beautiful old cemetery and I went to the most mosquito ridden corner where all the coolest vines and statue, 19th century figurative statuary was. And I set up my tripod and took all these great photographs and I came back and I spent months printing them and getting them ready for kind of displaying to all the faculty member, members. And then one of the the faculty members who I really respected uh, looked at them and said, well, these are nice, but what are you doing? <laughs> and it took me a minute, but uh, it was it was kind of a, uh, uh, a critical elbow drop, you know? He just really slapped me in the face and said, these are cool sculptures that I see in your photographs, but what are you doing? You know, what are you adding to it? And that was a nice, uh, or wasn't nice, it was unpleasant, but it was uh, the kick I needed at the time to say, you need to make sure that you're injecting yourself into your, into your own work. And it was great watching Aaron Coleman uh, speak or listen to him speak, was it last week or the week before? It was last month, but yeah, close enough. <laughs> but uh, because he talked about the same thing where he had a, a, um, a mentor or a professor say, you know, this is cool work, but where are you in the work, right? I don't, I don't see you in that. And I think a lot of us, I would imagine, have had a, a similar version of that experience, you know, where someone just kicks us a little bit and, you know, says, are you just spinning your wheels or, or are you really making something that's uniquely yours? Would you, uh, would you mind sharing some work then so that, uh, 
And also there's like a thousand questions. So we, we can do sure. a, a thousand great questions. I have the best yeah. students, they're really good. Um, and while you're sharing your work, um, this will probably factor into when you're sort of, when you show your work. Um, I, I, do you experiment with different kinds of cameras, um, Polaroid? Uh, what, what's your preference for, um, what, what, what have you worked with and what's your preference for um, making? Yes, you know, like everything. And I think that's one of the things I really struggle with is uh, when I first built a website years ago when, you know, and Juan can definitely attest to this, when you used to have to do your own coding, you know, it was a huge pain in the ass, a lot of time, you know, and, um, and I was so proud of it. Another, a different professor, uh, I put that work up and I showed him, I published it and he said, you know, it's, it's great, Travis, but you know, we all do lots of different things, but we don't have to share them all. <laughs> you know, it was, again, another like gut punch where it's just, it was right. You know, I was showing every kind of diverse thing that I did because I was excited about it all. But his point was, if you want to like, you know, think of your favorite band, if they come out with a new album and suddenly they change their sound completely, of course, they have the creative right to do that. And sometimes we can feel really boxed in by those expectations of the audience. But I think if you want to kind of pursue art long term, you have to take your audience into consideration as well. You know, are you are you giving them something to connect to uh, that has a degree of consistency? And it doesn't have to be visual. It can be thematic, you know, or, or any number of ways that you can keep a, a thread running through all your work. But um, that's an that, interesting idea when it comes to how people use Instagram as a portfolio space sometimes. And, you know, they're mixing in pictures of their weekend or pictures of their animals, and then they have art and it just gets really- it's, Or, it's their, really or their girlfriend, right? Right. Or, yeah, it gets really complicated really quick yeah. and then it becomes less effective as a tool. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting that you got that criticism, you know, however many years ago and it's still, a problem and even it's probably worse than it ever has been before as far as trying to find the work of an artist and and as a curator I'm looking at stuff all the time and I look at people's Instagram it's like oh cool they went to the Grand Canyon oh there is the sculpture you know like there's it just takes a little bit of time and it gets really distracting in, in a lot of ways I'm still guilty of that my stories are like 90 percent my dogs you know, but then my my feed is all usually uh, just my ten type, you know, nineteenth century photography work that I do. That I'll, I'll show you in a minute. But uh, but yeah, I'm guilty of that too. But a lot of times, students, you know, when they'll follow my Instagram, they'll they'll say, "Hey, you didn't follow me back." And I always tell them, "If you get an account that's just devoted to your artwork, I'll follow you back right away." You know, I I'm, I don't expect you to be interested in you know weird aspects of my personal life any more than I am in yours. Like. I wish you well, but I want to see the, the artwork you're making, you know, and, and I could follow my own exam or recommendation a bit better at times on that too. Yeah. Good questions. Um, I'm going to throw another one in. Um, and I feel like we've talked about this before, or even when I would bring the students in, um, just sort of this conversation about, um, I'll read the question. With photography phone, phone cameras are getting better and better. What's the main difference you find between a handheld camera and an iPhone camera? And what's your opinion when people say that phone cameras are just as good as handheld cameras? Um, well, they're not, um, they're not, they're awesome. They're, they're great. And you could argue in some ways they're, they have advantages. I can't remember whose quote I'm completely stealing here, but they say the, the best camera is the one that you have on you, you know? And so you always, most people always have their mobile devices on them. And so that's a profound advantage to, you know, am I always going to have this, you know, in my hand? Probably not. Can I even get this into spaces and angles and perspectives for shots that I might be able to get with my, my mobile device? And so, um, but, you know, it depends on, we have these, these words, you know, we have these words art and we all think we're talking about the same thing. Or we have this word photography and we all think we're talking about the same thing, but we're not. We all say the word the best, right? The best camera, the best, you know, um, you know, tool for anything, but what do we mean, right? That comes with a whole, like ton of criteria and the best depends on your needs and the circumstances and whether you're interested in the taking of those photographs or the final result that you produce, you know, some people, the best means the sharpest, 
you know, that's not necessarily always a big concern for me. Although I know if you look anywhere on the internet, you'll see people obsessing over megapixels and this and that, you know, um, it's, it's an issue, but you have to ask, is it an issue for you? So I think, you know, I've got a, a Sony camera here. That was just an old film camera right over my shoulder uh, is an old view camera. I use all sorts of cameras, you know, all the time. And typically a lot of the photographs that I make begin with a sketch, a terrible thumbnail sketch in a sketchbook. And then I, I create the image later on, usually through a, a process that might take take weeks, you know, before I, I completely build it. But that's been a tough thing for me too. I always feel, and I talk with independent study students about this a lot, really scattered because there's, there's more things that I want to do than I will ever have time for. And for me, the most difficult issue as a creative person is focus, right? Focusing my efforts in a way that's gonna produce a meaningful result because there's always something like shiny going by, you know, whether it's a new process or a new artist whose style I want to mimic or, you know, a new idea that I had or a subject I want to photograph, you know, there's always something, something new to kind of distract you from what you're working on. Um, the a side hustle question, um, hold on, where did it go? Before you becoming a professor, did you have side jobs where you got to use photography or you know, sort of make money as a photographer before becoming a professor. He still does side hustles, kids. Yeah, this is a, everything back here is a side hustle. Um, you know, and this is why it's never. I mean, free time. I think depending on on the the week or month is is either a, a choice or a luxury or I don't know. But there's always you know something to be doing. Uh, when I was a student. Um, I didn't know much about art. Uh, you know, I, I came again from a small town in Kentucky. I didn't really have any art courses or knowledge of art. Didn't grow up close to museums. Um, and so I was very interested in it, but I didn't know anything about it. And I didn't realize that when you say photography, it wasn't just this kind of monolithic singular thing, right? So I tend not to tell people that I'm a photographer because it really just confuses the issue, right? They think, oh, weddings or senior portraits, and that's not what I, I do at all. I did photograph a wedding like in the pre-digital era when it was only film. I was terrified, terrified. It sucked, I hated the experience, never wanted to do it again. Some people love it. They built amazing, rewarding careers out of doing that, but it was not a good fit for me. So that was, I, I even had one of my classmates be my assistant. So we'd have redundant cameras in case one broke down or shooting rolls of film in case one roll of film got ruined somehow. Um, and I found that so stressful. The, you know, the father-in-law was a jerk and like just, you know, all the stuff that I did not like about making work, you know? And I, I think I've always been really selfish uh, with regards to art because I have creative things that I want to do and I don't want anybody else telling me what it's supposed to look like in the end. You know, I want, I want to request critical feedback from people I trust, you know, that kind of thing. But I don't want, um, I was never interested in pursuing photography in a way where I was working for, for clients. Well, you know, that's tough if you want to make money because clients typically are the one who pay you. Um, and luckily teaching has been, uh, something that is one, just really rewarding and I happen to like a lot, but also it's provided me, um, you know, a, a job, right? So it's, it's been my career. Um, so I'm not, if I want to make something, I can make it all my own. I'm not necessarily dependent on clients for the, the look and feel of the work that I create. But yeah, I say, you know, for students, make money, you know, on your art, make your own art. But if you can find ways to sell your work, it feels good. You know, uh, it's just, it's better. I think sometimes and ending up with a closet of things you've made that never have a life, you know, get it on a wall, maybe not necessarily selling it all the time, but get it out there, show it, share it. People might want it, you know, and I think there are a lot of, there's a lot more competition these days because we're interconnected, but then there's a lot more opportunities these days because we're interconnected. And I've got some students that, you know, just left ECC, you know, a semester, a year ago, and they're selling their work pretty regularly online. So, you know, there, there's ways to get your, your stuff out there and you just feel it out as you go. Great. 
Travis. Um, do you have, can you share any experiences of photographing in other countries? And if there's similar, if there's any parallels or obvious differences or just sort of like cool experiences um, photographing abroad? Yeah, I've, I've done a lot of that. And it's, I posted on my website um, and I'll, I'll pull it up in the background. Um, but I, um, I don't really think of that typically as my, my primary photography, you know, um, even though I, I tend to, to share it on my website. Let's see here. And I think part of that is because when I do photograph abroad, it's really hard or traveling anywhere. It's hard for me not to just be in that tourist mode, that mindset where I'm just so fascinated by everything that I encounter. I end, I end up with a lot of photographs of my time there, but I don't really know that I'm creating a body of work that really presents anything new to anyone looking at the photographs, unless they haven't been to that place, right? Um, and of course, anybody could do that that work, right? It's like, here are my vacation photos. Um, you know, I try and compose them nicely with the skills that I have in photography and art, um, but I think there are some really interesting projects that people have done um, internationally. And when I, I look at my own work, you know, I, I don't see it that way, you know, it's like, and, and maybe my maybe my my bar is too high, but uh, you know I just got done in history of photography, and we had a discussion post in the digital photography classes on Robert Frank's The Americans, you know, which was um, still one of the, the most important you know photo books you know that that there's been. And when we we look at how that presented a completely different perspective and slice of reality on how Americans saw themselves. Um, you know, it's like that is taking your camera and doing something with it that's not just a, a travel log, that's not just a vacation photo. And I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with the travel log, but I, I think if you're pursuing your work creatively and you're aware of other things that have come before and other work that are pe that people are doing, I think it's good to kind of be critical of yourself in that way and say, really, what am I offering here? What am, am I giving somebody a pretty picture to put up on their wall, well, that's, there's a place for that too. You know, there's a huge history going back to you know ancient art of just making things for their aesthetic merit, right? To whether they're textiles or decorative objects or whatever. That's that's not something that we necessarily have to blow off. But um, if we jump into, let's see. I can pull off on questions. Are you going to show your, your your website? Yeah, I'll jump in there real quick okay. and just show a few examples. On. You know, so some of this, I'm, I've been in the process of updating some of these galleries that are acting a little wonky, but I've just got it, you know, designated by location, you know, in some of the places. So, you know, when I think about some of the things I've shown in history of photography, you know, an image like this would have kind of a, what we call decisive moment feel. Well, that's a, that's an approach to photography that's, I wouldn't say no longer valid, uh, but it's, it's a well-trod <laughs> approach to to image making and while i like this image i'm not sure that i'm really offering anything uh unique and again i, I could say i could look at this work if i wanted to be self-critical and say where where am i in this work you know um what was this experience for me or what am i really trying to communicate with this body of work other than just pictures of here's what i saw while i was there and that to me is one of the the hardest things about art making. I think if you take art classes, the ability to make things that look cool, you'll find is a skill you can master pretty quickly. Right? So, you know, just making attractive images, whether they're drawings or paintings, um, you know, hopefully at some point that becomes like your low bar, you know, and, and then it's more about what do I want to, what do I want to communicate? What am I trying to say with this work? Um, I'm going to ask a question that's not on the chat, just that, that I, looking at these, I, I thought of it, but there's so many good questions, we'll get to them. Um, do you, does a subject, whatever your, your subject is, does that inform or dictate what process you use or what camera you choose 
Um, do those two things speak to each other or do they not? Yeah, absolutely. And um, this is nothing against digital because I teach digital. I love the digital tools, but I also know my own relationship with that medium, uh, especially having started in photography in the darkroom. Um, I'm not saying that digital is easy at all because there are a whole host of complex technical and uh, creative issues that come with it, but it's immediate in a way that analog photography is not. And I struggle with how that immediacy, in my opinion, usually decreases my perception of the quality of the work, where I don't feel like I put as much thought into what I'm doing um, when the ability to capture something is so immediate, right? Um, even just having images sit on a roll of film for a couple of days before I have the opportunity to then see them, right? They're, they're late, they're invisible. They're on this roll of film. I've taken them. I kind of have the memory of what I shot in my head, but then I got to get back to home or the dark room and then I develop it. It just has time to marinate, you know, and then you look at the thumbnails. Once you print it up the proof sheet, the contact sheet with all the small thumbnails, you look at it and then there's even more time where you have to think, well, which one of these do I want to enlarge? And there's a process in that. And I think the ability for that to be decidedly inconvenient and stretched out really has an impact on, um, I think, the, the depth of thought that goes into my work. Uh, so absolutely. Um, you know, and some projects work for that and, and some don't. You know, there, there's a project that I was trying to do um, Let's see, there's a project that I was trying to do. I'm not sure if I'll be able to find it. Let's see. Okay, am I sharing my whole screen or just a window right now? You just it see my like website? Just a window. All right. Yeah. Okay, so here, here's a, uh, a series that I was doing with these, and this is something Juan and I and a couple other people who teach photography got together like, it's been two or three years now. When I first started like showing my initial tests in this, and it's still a project that I've not gotten back to, but I'm, I'm still very much interested in. I don't intend to let it go. I just started collecting all these trophies, and then I, I built this you know, platform for them to go into. And in my mind, this is something that I was going to do with a 19th century process. I like the idea of, of using these uh, emblems of success, you know, especially when they're all like kind of piling on top of each other. And this was all born out of this idea of like everybody always having to be first, right? First in line, first in traffic. Everybody had to get there first. Everybody had to be the first. And while I am pro personal achievement. And I think that's a really good thing. I also see kind of problems with that too, that, that kind of drive that sometimes destructive drive to achieve and, um, you know, the, at the cost of others. And so the trophies became this um, not so subtle symbol of that. And so I planned to shoot them with a 19th century process, but none of the images were really coming out the way I wanted them to. And then I did some test shots digitally and it really started to, to get the look and feel that I was hoping for. Um, and so this was gonna be one in a pattern where you gradually see more and more in the background. So I'm really putting photo principles into play that I teach even in digital one with how do we control that shallow focus or how deep the focus is. And so using digital tools became to me the better solution for creating this body of work that still I feel like I'm just getting started on. But I'll go back to Amy's question and say, it's still the fact that I started in analog that kind of, I think, pushed me to the realization, allowed me that length of time to think about this work. Now, I don't think that is requisite for anybody. It's just what works for me. Um, and I could probably artificially impose ways to stretch out, you know, the creation of work digitally that would mimic my, my analog approach, but it's just kind of built into analog. So it's, it's been useful in that way. Um, here's a question, and I'm going to add one on to it. Um, 
do you feel like social media has influenced any photography trends? And I'm also going to add like on a scale of one to a hundred, how much do you hate like Snapchat and like Snapchat filters and, um, you know, do you, do you <laughs> yeah. run, run with that? Yeah, I mean, it's influence. I mean, I, I love, I think I've been, uh, no pun intended, exposed to more artists than, than I ever could have been, uh, thanks to social media and a lot of the people, especially there are people out there kind of sharing. But it's exhausting, you know. Um, there are problems, and this may have already come up in art appreciation, but there are huge uh, kind of historical great things about institutions and museums, but there are really embedded problems with those institutions too. Um, and so I like that kind of the internet and social media has, has fractured, fractured that a bit, made maybe it more accessible in some ways or provided alternative outlets in some ways. Um, but I just find it impossible to keep up with just the volume of good stuff. I feel like this is maybe something a lot of you can relate to is, uh, or maybe growing up with it, you don't feel the same sort of pressure. But when I think about all my friends who say, oh, have you seen this show? Have you seen that show? Or this one's on Prime or this one's on Netflix? I, I can't, you know, it's just, it's almost stressful. Like my leisure has become stressful in that I don't, I can't keep up with all the great content out there. Um, and so, you know, that's the, the benefit for me, but also the downside. Um, I was talking with students the other day about uh, the benefit for creative people of just calculating how much time in a given day you are um, consuming content versus creating content. And you don't have to be an artist, right? You can, uh, you know, the act of creation can be cooking a meal that you've never cooked before, or, you know, <laughs> humming a song or, or whatever, doing a doodle or, um, but we are so much now constantly just eating information, eating, eating information around the clock, you know, and I think um, getting back to a blank page sometimes is, is really beneficial. So yeah, I have like a lot of people, I think that love hate relationship with technology, with internet, with social media, uh, you know, if we even think about our current circumstances and how much a lot of us were excited to, to have Zoom get togethers, you know, and we'd have Zoom happy hours with people we hadn't seen for a while. But man, there was a drop off because we were all just maxed out, you know, we were just maxed out. And so um, with Snapchat and things like that, I probably spent, you know, in my life, 30 minutes on Snapchat, you know, and then add an app and then deleted it. So I, I, I don't really do that a lot. But then, you know, some of the other platforms like Instagram started incorporating the filters and the, the goofy faces. Like my attitude historically has been um, things like Instagram, maybe not Snapchat, but Instagram, if it encourages people to take photographs and look at the world around them and interact with other people, my traditional view is that's got to be a positive thing, right? Like, but I think so much of that is is that we're not looking at the world. We're definitely not looking at the world in a critical or investigative way uh, or curious way. I think our, our devices have become more mirrors than they are cameras, right? We're looking at ourselves both in really positive ways sometimes, but I think sometimes we are like just standing in front of a mirror all day long. And I think, I don't know. I mean, it's hard. I don't want to be the old person who says everything new is, is bad, you know, but it does concern me, you know, it, kind of linking back to that notion of just eating information all the time. But then also, you know, what are we, when are we looking outward? Right? So I think those are flip sides of the same issue. Um, that's interesting. You mentioned the mirror aspect. Uh, there's a curator named John Sharkowski who wrote a book, I believe it's called, or, ooh, I don't know if he wrote the book, but, uh, he coined the phrase of that photography is uh, nothing but windows and mirrors, right? And that's always what it's been. So trying to switch gears here a little bit, I'm very curious, someone I believe had asked um, who, what artists inspire you or something, there was an inspiration question at some point there. I'm, I'm, I'm also curious about that, but um, besides an artist who might have inspired you, uh, what, uh, other non-art related people who inspire you or, or does your work harmonize with or how you think does that like parallel with them 
Like, do you have any other people like that that you think about or that, that you take into consideration? Um, yeah, I mean, I think still art, but maybe I, I look at, at people that um, uh, draw a lot. And so I've, I've always had a real strong fascination with that. I mean, I think even from like many kids at a young stage, that was, you know, that was art for me. That was the act of creation and just scribbling and the, and the pure joy out of seeing a mark that I made. On, on paper, you know, and even, you know, when I've been over, you know, and, and seeing like, uh, um, you know, one of your kids want to do a drawing, you know, and just that you witness how much, you know, enjoyment, how they're lost, right? That notion of flow and getting lost in, in that activity. Um, and so I look at artists, there's some that are, I can, I can bring them up. I don't have the, uh, and it's weird. I, I, I tend to, in my photography, I feel like I like kind of structure and, and simplicity most of the time. But drawing, I tend to favor artists who work with a lot of detail and complexity. Um, let's see. So one of them is, uh, if I can open up a new tab here, Jason Watson. And a lot of times they are, uh, there's a figurative realist element to them. Um, I, I like abstraction too, but what I like about figurative work for myself is um, it's a it's a great self measure uh, to see to, to to gauge your own skill. I think, or um, it's a standard from which you can deviate. So if you know kind of the proportions of a human figure or a human face, um, the playfulness of distorting those things I think also becomes a part of that. So I, I like that as kind of a a point of departure in, in the work that I create, but also in the, the work of others. So, you know, in some of this, I started falling way back when, and so much of it too is like mixed media. And so uh, a lot of things that I enjoy doing, like breaking the frame, right? Where are the edges of this? You know, there's not just a, yes, it's in a rectangle as we're viewing it on the internet, but if we look at the thing itself, it's kind of using multiple materials, multiple surfaces, it's deviating from that strict rectangle or those boundaries that we're used to. Um, it's creating this uh, trompe l'oeil kind of illusionistic depth or fake reality to it that I like, but there's also uh, the recognition that it is drawn, right? It's not pretending necessarily to be uh, a real person, but rather an illustration of a person. And yeah, just the connection to illustration um, as opposed to maybe other traditional styles of painting and drawing. Um, I, I really like. So Jason Watson's one that I've, I've followed for years in that regard. Um, the other one, Kim Jong-ji. Um, this guy is just out of control with a brush pen. And I almost just like watching him work in the video clips more than anything. Um, but the detail and, and some of this, some of the subject matter can get pretty, um, you know, extreme at times. So I'm not sure what I'm going to be clicking into here, but just really intense approach. And it's the complete opposite. How he teaches drawing is totally different from the way that I was taught drawing or even how I would teach drawing now, which is like heavily, heavily observation based. His is still observation based, but his whole argument is go observe learn the world, you know, look at this lamp on the table, look at it, look at it, look at it, remember it, remember it, remember it, and then go draw it, right, somewhere else, um, which I just really appreciated that it's a, it's a complete departure from any way that I ever come to know how to draw, and I think he's clearly, you know, gifted in a, in a way that, you know, might not be <laughs> mappable to the average person, but um, so yeah, it's this kind of complexity. And I think the, the trophy images that I had up before, I was probably a couple of years ago, really, really looking at Kim Jong-ji right about the time I started doing that stuff, which is not kind of the aesthetic of, of how I usually approach my, my work. In non-art, you know, I think I look to a lot of uh, philosophy, partly just for my own personal happiness. Um, and also as a departure from the, the pace of things in my day-to-day -day life. So um, I really like a lot of Alan Watts uh, philosophy. I'll share that with students. They just had a discussion post that was about um, kind of pursuing your own creative desires, but then also looking for ways to calm your mind. 
that's something, again, I really struggle with because I'm like, you know, what is, what's that movie where it's like squirrel, you know, it's like, I'm always like distracted and excited about something new, but that also creates a degree of, I think, stress and anxiety. So Alan Watts was responsible for bringing uh, him amongst others, a lot of Eastern philosophy um, to an audience in the United States when they weren't as familiar with a lot of those concepts. And so in the seventies, he was introducing some of these things in a way that was digestible for, you know, a Western or an American audience. And so I'll share some of those things. And they're usually just basic kind of meditative principles or way of kind of revisiting your, your daily experience in a way that's more contemplative and, and deliberate, as opposed to just doing, 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 going, going, going all the time. Thanks. Um, I actually have a, a, you might want to still keep sharing your screen there because sure. um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the photography classes that you teach and you offer and then maybe show the, your um, course website that you use. Is yeah. That yeah. Yeah. And I, um, you guys, this was, I, I shared something earlier this week from Travis. So this is like the, the extended version. Um, and if you guys had questions about the courses that I shared, now'd be a good time to hop on and get those answered too. You're talking about this one? Yeah. Yeah, so this is still a, a work in progress. And right now I've got my digital photo students creating um, flip books of their recent, where they designed a book in Lightroom, which is the program I had up a moment ago. So they're learning how to use that professional software. They make those books and hopefully this will in the near future feature the, the results of their, their creation. So it's all their photographs then put creatively into a book format. But so in uh, my history of photography class, one of the projects was a, a self-portrait, um, but there's specific criteria. It's not just turn in a self-portrait. There are really specific ways. I'm asking people to follow the assignment, and then we look at a number of options, the results, and then we choose the best out of that, and maybe even revisit and go back um, and, and redo it in some cases. But you know, these are meant to be indicative and uh, of their personalities, and we talk about how a, a portrait and a picture of a person are two different things, right? really, really different things and, and why that might be. And so they get to post their work here, you know, for share with family and friends and things like that. I've also got a lot of students right now working with Adobe Spark, which anybody can sign up for. Um, you just need to create an Adobe ID. And that's a great place if you've never thought um, you could make a website or make a photo collage online, uh, pretty, User friendly, I would argue, and um, and something that you could do. You know, so I have a few things right here, like I had mentioned, Alan Watts uh, that I made available. Um, have you seen the the solo wit? Uh, yeah, uh, recitation. I have. It's really good. You guys should check it out at some yeah. point. Yeah, it's a good one. It's basically just uh, you know screaming at people to create, but in a really entertaining way and that's Benedict Cumberbatch you might recognize from who's Dr. Dr. Strange. Uh, and then resources you know that I'll have sometimes for beginning students or just basic things like how to use your iPhone in a way that's more effective even if you're not a photo student. And then sometimes I'll put uh, readings or this will be over time a, and a list of readings I'll make available for students that they can come refer to or, or revisit. So one of the reasons I like creating stuff like this, um, I have uh, kind of mixed feelings about D2L. Uh, it's you know a place for you to get your content, but what I don't like about D2L is when you're no longer my student or when you're no longer at ECC, suddenly you're cut off from all those resources, which as an instructor, you know, I feel is kind of garbage, right? In the past, I, if I gave a student a handout, they get to keep that handout, right? They don't have to turn it in when the class is over. And so having kind of external, quasi-external sites like this, you know, allow you to come back and revisit content if you transfer to another school or, you know, there, there's something, an issue that you didn't learn quite as well as you would have liked to, you can revisit it at a later time. Um, and then there are some things that related to, you know, the, the current pandemic, you know, examples of photography that was reflective of kind of pandemic uh, circumstances or a history of pandemics, you know, in photography, All right? So what, um, 
on a semester to semester basis, what classes do can students sign up for? Uh, right now online, we've got, uh, well, the history of photography, uh, digital photography one um, will allow you to do multiple things once we're back on campus. So if you were to take online digital photography now, uh, you could take digital manipulation in the future, which is Photoshop heavy. It's big time chop shop, make crazy images, splice and combine images um, that is also online. And then when campus reopens, you could also take studio and location lighting right, where you'd be able to, to work with professional lighting equipment and, and that sort of thing. I'm trying to see if I can. Uh, and darker one and dark room. Yeah, dark room, definitely. I mean, that's where I like working with the chemicals and, you know, any of this stuff, if you're intimidated by it, I get a lot of students, again, I keep talking about drawing. Um, you should take photo, not drawing, right? But uh, <laughs> I keep talking about drawing because students will be um, intimidated sometimes and think, oh, I, I can't really draw. You know, I didn't take any art classes in high school or, you know, I don't know if I'll be a good photographer. Or I don't know if I'll be good at painting. You know, these classes are for you. They're, they are designed for people with zero experience. Right? And so there's no question you're going to get in a class and there's going to be some hot shot that's had years of experience and they're going to blow everybody out of the water. It's like that in every class. But the classes are made for people that have zero experience. Or maybe your major is nursing or maybe your major is poli sci and you just want to try it out and and see if it's something that you you enjoy you know it's for you too right you don't have to be a major pursuing that moving forward so let's see if i can jump into are you taking us to d2l i am oh boy sorry i know last thing you want right So um, as I'm sure you're getting, this is a lot of, uh, Amy, is this primarily art appreciation or art history or? Not a mixed bag. Okay. Yeah, so we have, um, you know, probably like you're having now, there are just discussion posts and, um, you know, these are, are fun for me to, to read, you know, if I can use that, that word, <laughs> but I do enjoy reading student responses, but they're, um, usually there are topics that are kind of coming up right now, you know, just making photography easier, make it better. A little clip from Jurassic Park there in the background, um, asking, you know, sometimes tough questions, you know, for someone who teaches photography, are photographs still relevant, right? Do they still have the same power that they used to have once upon a time? Um, I'm sure you've heard about Banksy, right? So here's some stuff about uh, uh, Banksy and the inherent value in art, you know, um, the, the cost of art, selling art, you know, Thomas Kincaid is in part of that mix too. So probably some things you might have dealt with in your other classes. And then there's going to be a little white zombie clip here. You remember them, Juan? <laughs> Shaking your head. No, yeah. no, I do not. And then this I is do. one that would be, you know, um, artists who use photography, right? And so these are places where we kind of address some of those things that are maybe more contemporary, right? That are going to affect students today. Awesome. I am actually going to um, start sharing something, I share a screen real quick, just so I can uh, let the people know. Um, so if you guys should have all seen this website at some point, it's art.student.elgen.edu. All right. That's our new home. That's our new URL. So if you want to look up any resources or any information about the art department or what's going on here, um, it's going to be art.student.elgin.edu. And we're going to have this lecture and we also have the previous lectures already up um, with Vaughn Clark Peterson, uh, Catherine Jacoby and Aaron Coleman. So you can go there and watch those if you need to, you know, pretend like you were here the whole time, get that extra credit you need. You know how it is. We also have over here, if you have more in-depth questions, we have uh, about the program, we have the different areas. And I just wanna point out, if you go to photography, for example, um, you are gonna see uh, you know, a little bit of snippet of uh, probably um, what Travis, and I think you, you've saw this before, how photography can access. 
Um, but you get to meet, you know, the professor, Travis, there, and you got a link to his website that he showed you so you can get more uh, in depth there. And then a little description about the classes. But also, what you're going to start to see um, with photography is uh, we've got some, some studio tours that you can go and you could possibly see inside of the um, what the dark room um, finishing room looks like. You could also go in and see some um, former uh, alumni student work and sometimes in some cases current student work um, that'll be listed there. It's slowly populating for some reason. There we go. Um, and so you can see some really awesome stuff made by your contemporaries. Uh, you could look through all the other um, departments here if you'd like. Uh, so it's a good resource to have this. And we also have on that photo page, guess what? Right here at the very, very top, we have the courses that are offered as of right now. Um, we also have a link to that very website that Travis was showing you. Okay, so all those resources are there for you um, from here to the future. Um, make sure you share it with your friends. But that's going to bring us to the end of this talk. So we want to thank Travis uh, Linville for stopping by and you know giving us a little bit of uh, uh, photographic love, so to speak. Um, <laughs> and uh, we hope to work with you in the future um, and uh, possibly <laughs> possibly uh, have more photographic. Uh, lectures and uh thank you all for making the time of stopping by and listening to us and be sure to pay attention for next semester because i think we're going to have we already have one photographer scheduled jasmine clark she has a reschedule but i think that's in january and we're still formulating the schedule so I'll keep an eye out for that anything you want to say Amy, Travis? Uh, just thank you. You guys did great questions. We didn't get to all of them. Um, if you asked a question, just make sure you include it when you write up your um, artist review talk. You guys, as always, asking really great questions. So thank you. And thank you, Travis, for um, spending the hour with us. And thanks always, Juan, for putting making it all happen. Yeah, and if you think you're gonna, um, you're interested in signing up for a photo class, we do have cameras for semester long checkout. And they're even, um, Laptops, right? So if you're, you're struggling with computer issues, things like that, we have MacBooks for students to use so you can utilize the software. So that's available. Awesome. Well, thank you. And everyone have a great weekend and a great rest of the semester. Thank you.